I'm uh, Dr. Chris Carlston. I'm an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia in the Department of Medicine with an affiliation as well at the School of Population and Public Health. We've been interested in how genetic differences in individuals and populations can help us understand why in, in some cases the exposure to air pollution has a more dramatic effect than others. Mm -hmm. And so in, in my lab where we actually expose individuals to diesel exhausts live in person, uh, we also determine in those individuals what their genotyping is for specific genes that we believe will metabolize the species in the body that are resultant from diesel exhaust. So in doing so, we can take a certain group of the individuals that have one type of genotype and others that have another look at them separately and see if they react differently to inhale diesel exhaust. Mm -hmm. So since the genes we're looking at are very, the, the genes are present in every individual and even the abnormal form of the gene is very common. So for example, in one of the genes we look at about 50% of individuals have the abnormal version. So you might say it's actually not abnormal, it's about half of the people out there. And, it, and because of that, and this is generally a worldwide phenomenon, being exposed to air pollution and almost half of the global population having such a variant, then we can actually understand how a very large fraction of the human pool of people can globally can actually be potentially adversely affected by air pollution. If, if we know that a certain large pop part of the population has an abnormal genotype that actually decreases the amount of air pollution that is necessary to adversely affect their lungs in this case, it could also be an effect on the heart or other organs. In my case, I'm focused on the lungs. So if a large par portion of the world actually has a genotype that reduces the amount of air pollution that's needed to damage their lungs, then the implication is that we need to reduce air pollution globally to that level so that we can protect the more vulnerable. So that's why I make the point that this is really about populations and public health, although it does ultimately affect individuals because so many people could be potentially be affected. We need to actually reduce levels down to the lowest common denominator so that we can fairly protect the vulnerable or susceptible groups in the world. I think there's potential for this to be applicable on a personal level, uh, but as I was saying in my previous comments, when you, when you think about this logically to the full extent of, of the science that we understand, while an individual may have an individual genotype that may make them ind individually more susceptible, that could be very important on a, for a rare genotype. But because the genotypes we're looking at are so common, it's more cost effective, and this is the important thing, it's more cost effective to reduce air pollution for everyone. Now this is, this is interesting for the listeners because as opposed to say a pharmacologic setting, a drug setting where you're thinking about giving one drug to one person, you want to know their one genotype or their one series of genotypes, that's very important. But of course, we're not really in a position to individualize air pollution exposure. Mm -hmm. We're all exposed to it. And to reduce air pollution in the community effectively, we, we really do have to reduce it for everyone because it's a pool of air that we're breathing in collectively. So that's why I say if there's a group, a subset, whether it's 10%, 20 30 or 50 that has a, a single genotype or a series of genotypes that makes them more susceptible, well, effectively, we should be reducing air pollution down to that lower level. It's going to protect the most vulnerable, but of course, at the same time, it's going to protect everyone else. So that's why I say it's more of a population-based thing. Mm -hmm. Of course, there may be, there may be cases down the line where individuals have a very specific scenario where we need to protect them very particularly. But I think that that is a much longer line of work before we get there. I, th I think it's, it's both more cost effective and also has a bigger impact in the, in the global sense to, to look at the more common genes to protect down to the level that is needed to protect people with those common gene abnormalities and then from there go along the line of, of research and, and application that may actually be applicable to more individuals uh, and individualized therapy. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to link with the regulators and policymakers, both in British Columbia and, and elsewhere in the world. First, to try to get from them what information do they want to know so that they could actually influence policy. For, so for example, uh, a very influential body worldwide happens to be in the United States, but what the United States 
EPA or Environmental Protection Agency does is often followed by others around the world. So I actually have a relationship with the EPA where I try to understand from them well, what kinds of information from research would be helpful for you to then move to the regulatory arena so that I know in advance what they're looking for. I can design my research around that, give them results that hopefully is what they're looking for and therefore affect policy.